In this video, I'm going to show you how you can use the built-in multiprocessing module to run your backtests in parallel, thereby utilizing more of the CPU on your machine and gaining a significant improvement in performance. By default, most Python programs are single threaded, which means if you're using a modern processor with let's say eight or 16 threads, rather than just running one backtest at a time on a single thread, so say looping through the different symbols, you could instead run eight or 16 backtests at once using the multiprocessing module, which would theoretically improve performance by a factor of eight or 16. There is some fine print around that and some situations where you wouldn't want to use multiprocessing, but I'll cover those later on. The great thing about multiprocessing is that it's super simple to integrate into whatever kind of backtesting system you have. No matter if it's a custom backtester that you've built yourself or an off the shelf backtester that you've gotten from GitHub, the implementation I'm going to show you today is under 10 lines of code. And so it's well worth benchmarking at least for your project and seeing if multiprocessing will work for you to speed up your backtests. So here we are in my Python environment here. I've already got a backtester set up because I want this video to focus on multiprocessing and how to plug that into your system. So I've got a dummy backtester here that's just using backtesting.py to run a simple RSI crossover strategy. So if the RSI goes over the upper bound, we sell, and if it goes below the lower bound, then we buy. Simple stuff. If you want to learn more about backtesting.py and how this works, I have a free course on it here on YouTube, which I'll leave in the description. So that's our strategy class, which details how our buying and selling logic is supposed to work. And then we have a function down here called do backtest. And what that does is it takes a file name. It loads that file from disk using pandas here, labels all the columns properly, does some manipulation with date times to make sure they look right, and then runs the backtester and returns to me the symbol and the return percentage. This function here is the one we're going to run in parallel. You'll need something analogous on your side. It'll vary depending on how your system works and the frameworks that you're using, but you want a single function that you give some input parameters to. So maybe the choice of symbol that you want to be backtested plus a few parameters, that kind of thing. And then this function is going to return a tuple of whatever you want to retrieve out of this backtest. So in my case, I'm just returning the symbol and the total return. So that's what you'll need to use the structure that I'm going to show you here. Just one function that does the backtest. It takes in some arguments, some maybe text or numbers, different parameters, etc., And it returns whatever information you'd like to report about this backtest in either a tuple, a list, or just a single number. Now, in order to run this in parallel, first we're going to do if name is equal equal to main here. And if you haven't seen that before in Python, basically what it does is it protects the contents of this if statement here from being run in a sub process. So in this section, we're going to tell Python to start up a bunch of other processes. What we don't want is we don't want those sub processes to go ahead and start up sub processes themselves and things multiply out of control. So we have this if name equals main here, and that means it will only run if this script is being directly executed, not if it was imported by another module or spawned in a sub process or anything like that. Now we will need to actually import some stuff from multiprocessing here. So at the top of your file, just do from multiprocessing, import pool. Multiprocessing is built in with all recent versions of Python. So you don't need to install anything with pip. And then back in your if statement down here, just do with pool as p. 
So we've got our context manager here. This will clean up any memory after the pool is done. Then inside this indented block here, I'm going to do p.map. So p is our pool here, so as p. And inside here, you can choose a function and then some data. So I'm going to do do backtest and os.listdir data. So if you remember, my function takes in a list of file names and basically I have this folder called data here and inside I have a bunch of one minute data from February of this year, just standard open, high, low, close stuff. If you're wondering where I downloaded all these files from, you can get them for free from data.binance.vision for crypto data if that's an asset class you trade. I'll leave a link to this website in the description. Let's return to Python here and I can show you the multiprocessing in action. Let's print out something when we start a backtest here. So at the start of this function, let's print the file name, for example, and we'll now run it. So we should see all the individual file names being printed out, roughly eight at a time, which is how many cores I have on this machine. By default, the pool will try and use as many cores as it can find on your machine. If you want to decrease that, you can just do something like this. You can put a number in there, say, now I only want it to use two at once, so to spawn two processors. And we can see that this is going to significantly slow down the backtest here. Let's do some timing here for comparison, and we can compare this approach to a serial approach where we just do the backtest one at a time. This is pretty simple with the time function. So I'll make a variable here with the start time. And then after the backtests have finished, I'll print out the time taken. Let's give that another run here now that we can measure how long it takes. So about eight seconds for the full backtest here. I've got 50 different data sets in this folder that are all being processed. We can also get the output of our do backtest function here. So this p.map will return a list of tuples here. So we're returning a tuple. It will return a list of those tuples for every single file path that we pass in here. So I'll just set this equal to results and then I can print out results at the end here and you can do whatever you want with that, write it down to disk, make a data frame with it, whatever your analytics process is. So that's what the finalized data will look like. You'll have your list of tuples here with whatever stats you decided to return from the backtest. Let's quickly compare this to the serial approach here. So I'll just comment out this section. I'll maybe copy and paste the bit that we've already used because I can reuse the timing bit here. I'll replace this pool section here with just a for loop iterating over the different file paths. So instead of assigning them all at once, like we did before with the results, we're just looping through this list here and running the function serially. Let's give that a run, see how long it takes this time. So that took about 32 seconds to run, which is well and truly slower than the multiprocessing version that we used earlier. And I definitely think justifies the extra work required. One thing that may happen if you're trying this out for yourself is you'll get some kind of error if this function here takes in more than one variable. So let's just take in a number here. We're not going to do anything with it, but we'll just take in this number. Let's see what happens to our map function now. We can see that our do backtest function is missing that other parameter and there doesn't seem to be a, a simple way to include it. The way you do this in multiprocessing is you change this to star map here. So instead of map, it becomes star map. And instead of just passing a list of single items that are fed into the first parameter of the function, you'll now want to pass a list of iterables. So Instead of just passing in os.listdir, so a list of all these file paths, what I now want to do is I want to pass in something that looks like this. So there's a path and then a number and then path two and then another number, 
etc, etc. I want to pass in a list like that, and then star map will map those to the appropriate variables. Easiest way to do that really is to use zip here. So I'll call it paramsia is equal to zip, then os.list dear data. And since this number parameter isn't doing anything anyway, I'll just provide a list of numbers from zero to however many data CSVs we have. And then I'll print out the list of these parameters here, just so that we can check that this is roughly working as we want it to. I have to scroll up past this error, but we can see that yeah, it's returning a file path and then a number. So zip is doing its work here, and then we'll pass in paramsia. Looks like it didn't actually execute anything because we exhausted this list here. So the zip, when we printed it out as a list, we went through the whole iterator and that got rid of everything. But if we don't print that out anymore, it should now work. So that's how you run a function with multiple parameters. There are a couple other things you might want to look at when it comes to multiprocessing. One of them is the max tasks per child parameter here. So by default, this is set to none, which means that all of the worker processes that get spun up, they last until the end of the pool. So until all of the tasks have finished, each worker process will remain alive. This might be a problem for you if you have some sort of memory leak in whatever you're running. The workers may continue to consume more and more memory, so you may want to limit this to a small number depending on your setup. So if I run this here and then quickly go back to HTOP, you can see all of these different processes being booted up here. Each of them have their own Python interpreter and all of that extra work needed to be done creates a not insignificant amount of overhead, which means that in some cases, multiprocessing in this way might actually be slower than doing things serially. So you want to benchmark that. A final thing is that multiprocessing behaves very differently on different platforms in different environments. It's typically a struggle to get it to work in Jupyter Notebooks. And if you're running on Windows, be especially vigilant for any blocks of code which are run outside of a function or a class. So if I had some random code here, like print hello, if I was running multiprocessing on Windows, every single subprocess that starts up would print out that hello message, which is fine if it's just a print, but if it's doing something significant that could result in a change in results in your backtest, you want to make sure that you keep it guarded by an if name equals main statement like the one here. So I hope you can apply what you've learned today about multiprocessing into your backtesting infrastructure, and I'll see you in the next video.